Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Will Bagley has contributed several volumes to one of the best histories in Western history called the Kingdom of the West. In our next conversation, we'll introduce this history to us and we'll find out more about it. All right, it's time to give away a copy of The Whites Want Everything. So, I've got all the people who entered in here and we're going to find out. We're going to shake it up really good and see who our winner is. And it's going to be... Julian Boswell of St. Charles, Missouri. So, congratulations, Julian. Um, I will be sending this to uh, you in Missouri. It's autographed by Will Magley. And so for the rest of you, um, we're going to talk about uh, about this book, so you'll find out what Julian got and who missed. And um, so that'll be exciting. Hey, I just wanted to mention one more thing. Our next conversation will be our last with Will Bagley. So if you are not a Patreon subscriber and would like to hear the final segment, you need to sign up to our free newsletter at gospeltangents.com slash newsletter, and I will send you a secret link to the final conversation with Will Bagley. So sign up today if you're not already a member. Now back to our conversation. All right, well, I know you've got another book, um, The Whites Want Everything, and one of the things we haven't talked about on my podcast is, is Utah's, I mean, we've kind of talked about it with Mountain Meadows, but uh, Mormons and Indians or Native Americans here. And could you tell us a little bit about your book, uh, The Whites Want Everything? Let me introduce the series first. Um, this is the Kingdom in the West series. Uh, it began in 1997 with publication of the original journal, uh, the official journal of the Brigham Young Company, which has sat in LDS archives for 150 years until I asked to edit it. And much to my surprise, they let me do it. And it sold quite well, and Bob Clark, who ran the Arthur H. Clark Company at the time, uh, knew how to promote books and did a bang-up job. And the first nine volumes, no, the first ten volumes of the series were published in Spokane, Washington. And they had the promo that Bob was so brilliant at writing, and he could always predict to about uh, a copy of how many books he could sell. Wow. And then in 2007 or so, when we had eight or nine volumes already completed. Um, Bob sold the company to the, art, to the University of Oklahoma Press, and they essentially, uh, the, the series essentially lost its bearings. But, the, 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 I blame it on the marketing manager, but it was probably that I'd taken too long and I'd wasted too much time. But I did get, eventually, uh, over 22 years, all, six, all the 16 volumes, I hope, to, not all of them, but a lot of them. And I'd always hoped to end the series with a book on Utah's Indians. Now, one of the deals I made with the Arthur H. or with the University of Oklahoma Press was to include a, a, to include color plates, mm -hmm. and so I got to do about eight colored plates, which is half of a signature. And here, of course, is a picture of Joseph Smith preaching to the Indians at Nauvoo. 
And you'll notice that this is before the Plains Indians became the definition of what Indians look like. And this is Red Jacket wearing a peace medal. And peace medals were what government agents handed out. Um, but this government agent was George Washington, and he handed it to Red Jacket. Um, and he's quite an imposing guy. Now, the reason he's in here is in 1822, he was on his way to talk to the Quakers about fending off land thieves. And he stopped in Palmyra, New York. Now, we don't know if Joseph Smith went to hear Red Jacket speak, but maybe he did. And then this guy, these are all unpublished. From here on, these, these are unpublished images. This is Wakara, who oh. was the great war leader of the Utes. And basically, he was, a, he was several things. He was like Brigham Young. That he was a great leader and a slaver and a gangster. <laughs> this is the white man's friend, Kanosh. And it's the youngest picture we have of Kanosh. And these were all painted uh, by William Warner Major, Major uh, who died in England in 1854, so they're 1855. So they're all very early paintings. And in many cases, they are of our, our best pictures. That hat is called what they call the Tam o Shanter. And on some of these images, you get an idea of how much Indians liked hats. And there's several documents in this book, one of which says they all want hats. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. This is not a good idea. <laughs> they, they don't show up very well. but. They look pretty good, actually. This is Washaki, Washaki, the great leader of the Shoshones, who lived almost 50 years longer, and it's the youngest picture we have of Wakara. Or no. Washaki. It's the youngest picture we have of Washaki, and since Washaki lived into the 1890s, we have a lot of pictures of Washaki. And this character is named Parachute. You'll notice he's clutching a, a piece of paper in his hand because Indians all wanted to figure out how to make paper talk, which is how they referred to writing. Huh. And then we have a Buffalo robe with pictures of a fight between Indians and soldiers. <laughs> but w one thing I wanted to do with this book was give Utah's Indians' voices. And I was amazed at how eloquent those voices turned out to be. Okay, I had several advantages in compiling this uh, selection from Mormon archives. And 
Artis Partial, who's quite a talented uh, journalist and historian, um, did a transcription of several hundred letters for Floyd O'Neill, who collaborated on the book. And I was able to search those. But then, uh, the church archives had been quite tightly locked up for most of the time I was working on Kingdom in the West. But, and I think I, think I can credit Kingdom in the West with at least partly getting the LDS church to open up its archives because history is not a threat to Mormons. Mormons are Mormons for many, many reasons, but history, I don't think, is one of them. Now, the, the, the trouble for me when they open up the archives, and this was done largely, I think, at the instance of Rick Turley and Marlon Jensen. Um, it was both liberating and time-consuming because I now had to go back and compare the transcripts I'd done and the, the partial typescripts to what was what I could see on the PDF files. And so that took years and years and years. And the main treasure I found uh, was way, way back, probably 25 years ago. And it's where I got this magnificent title, The Whites Want Everything. And it's dated June 6, 1853. And you can find it in the Holman Papers at LDS Archives. At the request of Major Holman, Indian agent for Utah Territory, I held a conversation with Chief Walker respecting his feelings and wishes re relative to whites settling on his land and the lands of Indians generally. He said that he had always been opposed to white settling on Indian lands, particularly that portion which he claims and on which his band resides, and on which they have resided since his childhood, and his parents before him, that the Indians, that, that the Mormons when they first commenced the settlement of Salt Lake Valley was friendly and promised them many comforts and lasting friendship, that they continued friendly for a short time until they became strong in numbers. Then their conduct and treatment toward the Indians changed. They were not only unkindly, but many were much abused, and this course has been pursued up to the present. Sometimes they have been treated with much severity. They have been driven by this population from place to place. Settlements have been made on all their hunting grounds in the valleys and on the graves of their fathers have been torn up by the whites. He said he wished to keep the Valley of San Pete and desired to leave the Valley of Salt Lake as he could not live in peace with the whites. But the whites had taken possession of that valley also. The Indians were forced to leave their homes or submit to the constant abuses of the whites. He said the Gosoki Utes, who formerly lived in Salt Lake Valley, had been killed and driven away. That's a reference to the Goshutes. And now they wish to drive him and his band away also. He said that he always wished to be friendly with the whites, but they never seemed to be satisfied. The Indians had moved time after time, and yet they could have no peace. That his heart felt sick. And that his heart felt very bad. He desired me very earnestly to communicate the situation of the Indians in this neighborhood to the Great Father and ask his protection and friendship that whatever the Great Father wished he would do. He said he always had been opposed to the whites settling on his lands, but the whites were strong and he was weak and that he could not help it. 
that if his great father did not do something to relieve them, he could not tell what they would do. I have had sincere talks with Soviets, the man that picks up fish from the water, to Kashabus, Black Belly, who have also expressed themselves, expressed themselves in the strongest terms against the whites settling on their lands. So Soviets in Uinta Valley and Tukibus on the river by the same name. It is a fine valley, well watered, and has plenty of game. These Indians and their ancestors have long occupied this country. They very much like to, to they very much dislike to leave it. They say they cannot live with the whites, for they cannot live in peace. The whites want everything and will give the Indians nothing. That they shoot the Indians if they walk over their grounds. I have been acquainted with this country. I have been acquainted with this country and these Indians for upwards of 30 years. I have known Walker, Soviets, and Tukaboos since they were children. I have always been on friendly terms with them. They talk freely with me and they express their feelings without reserve. Now, if I could talk to anybody in the history of Utah, it would probably be Martinez. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with historian Will Bagley. In our next conversation, we're going to tackle another massacre that occurred in the Utah ter Territory, known as the Bear River Massacre. Will Bagley will tell us how many Shoshone Indians were killed in this terrible tragedy. The Army reported 235, and there are Mormon sources that put the number at 500 or 450 or something. Wow. For those of you who are interested in the entire interview uncut without any interruptions, sign up at patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview for just $5 a month. Also, we have other tiers. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe on our website at gospeltangents.com, click on the yellow subscribe button and you can uh, subscribe for $10. You can also do that on Patreon and uh, get a PDF transcript. We've also got uh, some other ones uh, for $15 and $20 if you'd like to get those as well. If you're interested in individual transcripts, go to Amazon.com and do a search for Gospel Tangents Interview and you can see our past interviews there in paperback form. So uh, just check out Gospel Tangents. We're always updating those. For the latest updates on Facebook, go to Facebook.com slash Gospel Tangents and you can see our latest updates there. We're also on Twitter at Gospel Tangents. Of course, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts at tinyurl.com slash gospeltangents. And please uh, give us a five-star rating uh, for those of you who listen to the audio only. So once again, thanks for listening. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again.